Um, our next speaker is also really serious. He's um, a fellow Englishman. He's lived here in the US only for six months, so he has almost no friends. So after he's spoken, go and say hi to him. Um, he was educated at Imperial College in London. For those of you who don't know, Imperial College is an absolutely awesome school, especially for technology, and produces almost a very large proportion of UK startups come out of Imperial College. Um, and he's gonna talk today as the product lead of a company called New Cipher. And his focus is on privacy, protecting your privacy, and avoiding the calamities that can result from you know, common practice. For example, server-side decryption, which is used regularly at Google, is highly vulnerable. Um, and uh, New Cypher has a solution. So Arjun, come on up. Enjoy the stage. And I'll see you at the other side. Big applause for Arjun. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. So New Cypher is a data privacy layer for the decentralized world in general and blockchain. Um, and we give dApp developers, like yourselves, uh, the ability to share, manipulate, and manage data without ever having to, as um, was mentioned, decrypt it server-side. Um, and we do that by effectively keeping the data encrypted from the data sharer all the way to the data recipient. And we're able to provide that essential access control service through a decentralized key management system. So, so I'm gonna go through a couple use cases just to illustrate or give you a sense of uh, why we believe that this kind of service is uh, relevant or even critical to the blockchain ecosystem. So this is the most generic one, which is encrypted end-to-end -end encrypted uh, file sharing. So say, for example, you have a decentralized storage layer where data is stored across thousands of untrusted laptops and, and servers, um, and you want to share data with a, a new, a new um, recipient. So say you're working on a collaborative document and you're sharing with a, a colleague. Um, with New Cypher, you can do that without the data ever being decrypted along that journey. I'm going to jump into the second uh, use case or example, which is multi-user group chats. And actually, this applies to both centralized and decentralized uh, applications and uh, manifestations of this. Um, it's historically been quite a difficult problem to solve. Um, maybe one of the best options today uh, is the double ratchet algorithm, which Signal has provided and WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger users. But the basic idea of um, many-to-many -many sharing is that it's very expensive to in crypt data individually from every single participant to every single other participant in that, in that group chat. And actually, the new Cypher approach is a very elegant, scalable solution to this kind of problem. And the kind of general flow which you might have been noticing across these two slides is encrypt, re-encrypt, decrypt. And I'll dive into that in much more detail. Um, you probably can guess that the important step is the re-encryption part. So one more use case. Uh, so say you have a decentralized video sharing service where a content producer is uploading their, um, their videos or their, um, their content to a content distribution network that's also decentralized. And then essentially what's happening here is that viewers are paying for the right to decrypt that video stream. And again, New Cypher can transform the uh, the bulk data into a form that allows it to be decryptable by a valid recipient. And what you have here is condition-based um, uh, sharing. And here the condition is payment, but actually New Cypher allows any arbitrary condition um, to be used. So a simple one would be a time-bounded uh, access, so it would expire after some period of time. Um, but it, it's actually boundless in the sense that you can put any condition. And actually, once we work out uh, oracles and we have a robust oracle working model, you could um, tie the sharing of data to real-world outcomes, which is a very cool uh, possibility. OK, I know that this uh, diagram looked a lot like the previous three. But actually, this is to contrast 
what you can do with uh, new cipher in your stack and what happens currently today in the centralized world. So as a file owner, you want to, again, share data, share a file with a colleague or family member or whatever. Um, what happens when you uh, say you're using Gmail or, or Dropbox or something like that is that in order to grant permission to someone new, you have to decrypt the file server side. So you can see the contrast in the flow, encrypt, decrypt, re-encrypt, and then decrypt at the end. And as you have noticed, uh, new cipher avoid that first decryption step. Um, and you know, it's OK in general um, if you're using Gmail to trust Google. That's what you're doing. You're trusting Google. You're trusting the centralized platform. But that's not such a big deal. You might say, you know, Googlers are nice people, and that's not necessarily a problem. But it's more that this is a honeypot for hackers and perhaps state actors. And actually, this problem is far worse in the decentralized world because the server-side decryption isn't happening on a protected data center owned by Google. It could be happening um, in some basement somewhere uh, or in, a, in the jurisdiction of an oppressive regime. So I think it's, uh, you could describe um, this problem as a, w without our solution as a, a total non-starter for the blockchain world. Cool. So I'm a product guy by background, and therefore I have a very strong inclination to explain things in a lot of detail. So my goal is like within the next five, 10 minutes, you guys understand exactly how our system actually works. Um, I'm going to do that with the help of an animation, which I'll start in a second. Um, but our access control service relies on a technique known as proxy re-encryption. And just before I begin, uh, you can think of the proxy as an anonymous machine somewhere remote that's sole purpose in life is to take encrypted text and then transform it. So just bear that in mind as we go through this. Awesome. So uh, proxy re-encryption starts like many other approaches to data sharing. The data owner, Alice, is going to encrypt the data with her private key and then send it to live in some storage somewhere. So now she wants to share it with a designated recipient, um, Bob, on the right. At this point, if Bob were to try and use his private key to decrypt the data, he would be rejected. He wouldn't be able to decrypt the ciphertext and access the underlying data. So to get around this, what Alice does is she, her application rather, creates a special kind of key, which is called a re-encryption key. And this is made out of her private key and Bob's public key. At no point is her private key transferred anywhere it stays local. And so now what we're going to do with this re-encryption key is send it to an available proxy. So here it goes. And what the proxy is going to do, this is actually represented as a Raspberry Pi, is it's going to use the re-encryption key to re-encrypt the ciphertext so that Bob can use it, so it's useful to Bob. And the proxies in our network they do that in exchange for fees, which could be paid in ETH, and also for block rewards, which is quite a typical network setup. So now what emerges is a ciphertext that's useful to Bob and Bob only. And Bob can now use his private key to decrypt it and access the original underlying data that Alice intended him to see. OK, that was simple enough, right? Everybody understood? All right, so we're going to make it a little bit more complicated because our key management service has quite a lot more in the locker, actually. Um, I'm going to use another animation here. But just before I jump into that one, the, the difference between our system and just standard proxy re-encryption is that we use something called threshold proxy re-encryption. So let's see what that looks like. So the re-encryption key, which is very important, instead of just going to one proxy, is actually split and sent to many proxies, usually more than five, like 10 or 20. And each of those proxies, in turn, will uh, produce ciphertext that can then be combined to produce the complete ciphertext for Bob. And that seems like quite a small thing. But actually, by splitting the key up into many, many different parts, what you're doing is spreading the trust, right? So these proxies are kind of semi-trusted. Um, and what that means, actually, is that even if you have a misbehaving proxy who's maybe wants to do a denial of service attack or something like that, it's basically pointless because other proxies that have received the key fragments can step in and provide the service. 
So even if you have a malicious or corruptible or hackable or incompetent proxy, it really doesn't make any difference. And the power of the network, the multiple proxies, ensure that the data safely gets from the owner to the destination, the recipient. OK, so very briefly, I'm going to talk about uh, the threshold proxy re-encryption scheme, which is called Umbral. It's kind of our flagship product, so I want to just quickly talk about the specs. Um, of the algorithms. So uh, umbral, which means threshold in Spanish, it's not a very original name, uh, is what you might describe as, it's a unidirectional um, uh, scheme. So that means that Alice can encrypt for Bob, but not exactly in reverse. It's also single hop, which is another important property. So it can go from one party to the next, but then not to a third one. And then really, really important, it's a non-interactive scheme, which means that when we create the re-encryption key, we are only using one private key, which is Alice's private key. We don't need Bob's private key, too, which would make it an, uh, an interactive scheme. We used, if you remember, we used his public key. Um, we also use a KEM, DEM approach, and our uh, key encapsulation mechanism is an umbral um, produced cipher. And for the data encryption, we use ChaCha20 Poly 1305, which is a standard um, encryption approach. Uh, but you can swap that out for any other authenticated approach like AES256, which is pretty common. And we're also IND, PRE, CCA, secure. And I'm sure that slide meant more to some of you than others. So let's go to the next one. Um, yeah, a quick, quick word on the token ep economics, the crypto economics. So we use a proof of stake model for our proxies, um, where basically what that means is you need to hold our token in order to be a proxy. And again, that sort of further disincentivizes bad, be bad behavior. So if you, for example, are a proxy that uh, goes offline a lot or spits back some rubbish instead of actually producing the, uh, the ciphertext that the recipient needs, then you can have your stake of, K uh, of, um, of our token um, slashed. You also get more work, i.e. re-encryption jobs, based on how much you're holding. So if you hold more token, you get more uh, work, and therefore you get more fees. Um, we also have a pretty typical um, inflation schedule, which were the block rewards that I mentioned earlier um, for the proxies, where essentially um, the more you hold, the more you're able to gain, and that, and that, that uh, decays over time uh, as more fees come into the network and we get more adoption. Uh, we have a lot of people using us, so everything from data marketplaces uh, like Datum, which uh, enables users to auction their internet activity. You can see that there's a very useful access control uh, uh, problem there that we can solve. Um, we also are the access control layer for various decentralized databases like BlueZell. And with databases, what we're doing essentially is enforcing who can query the database. So in like a CRUD functionality list, create, read, et cetera. It's the read bit that's tricky for decentralized applications, and we can, um, we can solve that. And a very popular use case, there's actually like another 10 companies that I couldn't fit on this slide, is uh, the management of medical data and health records. So for example, Mediblock is a patient-controlled uh, decentralized application uh, for uh, health records. And they use New Cipher to grant access, for the patient to grant access to a new hospital and also revoke access to the old hospital when they, when they switch their health provider. Um, and there's a few other very interesting ones there. For example, Origin is a protocol for the sharing economy, and there's about 35 uh, companies built on top of them, all of which need access control uh, done in a proper way. Uh, we're backed by quite a few investors. Um, obviously, the most important is DHVC, uh, which was uh, the first speaker's um, firm. And yeah, it's, it's great to have a lot of people believing in us. And I'm going to wrap it up there. I just want to say, um, first of all, thank you for sticking with me through a fairly involved description of how it works. Um, if you want to go even deeper, you can find our white paper on our GitHub, you can also find a fully, a complete Python implementation of the Umbral scheme that I mentioned. Um, and finally, I'm going to be releasing a Jupyter notebook which goes through all of the functions in our, in our stack 
um, in a great amount of detail so that it's very easy to integrate and plan an integration of uh, our access control layer. And please come talk to me afterwards if you are a dApp developer or protocol that wants to make sure your user's data is safe when it's shared. Thank you. <laughs>